Hello, Lord Saints. I am so excited to be here with you at Bible Study today, Shekinah Christian Fellowship. We are live. Be sure to share with a neighbor. Tell a friend that Bible Study is starting right now. You are in week four of a Bible Study series that Shekinah has just started talking about creating a game plan for denying ourselves. So we are happy that you are here. We pray that you settle in, whether you are watching on Facebook, YouTube, or logged into our Zoom call, because we're going to have a discussion a little later on for our Shekinah Insiders at 730. We want you to feel welcome and definitely, definitely spread the word. Well, I am Dee Hillman, and you are watching Shekinah Christian Fellowship, where our bishop and founder is E. Henderson. Our pastor's title is Hillman Jr. And now is the time to get your Bible out, your notebook out, and get ready to get into this word. Last week, we were together talking about what it means to be approved and accepted by all. And I love that lesson because we really had some interesting discoveries. We really dug in deep and learned that approval and, accept, uh, and acceptance is not the end all be all. We need something better. We need something better than approval and acceptance. We need true belovedness and belonging. Well, that really sets the foundation tonight for our topic, which is going to be, drum roll please, defensiveness and responding to accusations. Go ahead and put that in the chat. Defensiveness and responding to accusations. This is what we are going to be talking about for the next hour. And boy, am I excited and I can't wait to dig in to this word with you all. I have a little subtopic and I think you're going to enjoy it. The subtopic is when no one wants to hear your side. Yep. When no one wants to hear your side. We're going right into this word, talking about defensiveness and responding to accusations. I want us to turn to Luke 4, and while you're turning there, we'll jump into prayer. God, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for uh, the ability to read your word. We know that there are so many um, countries and places where it is not okay to openly declare our Christianity or to even gather to worship. But we thank you, Lord God, that we are able to gather. We are able to even virtually have space to study the word of God, not only study it, but we have access to so many resources so we can dig in deep, get a better understanding and walk with clarity and purpose. Father, we're just so thankful. Move me out of the way and let us have an, a glory encounter today in Jesus name. Amen. Wow. Did I pray long enough for a Wednesday night Bible study? I thank you all for praying with me. We are in Luke four and we're going to go right to verse 16 and we are in the NIV version. Again, that's Luke 4, verse 16, and our topic tonight is defensiveness and responding to accusations when no one wants to hear your side. Are you guys ready for verse 16? I'll read. We have a bit of a story to navigate together, but because it's Bible study, we don't mind reading so many scriptures, right? Okay, let's get into it. Verse 16, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. I isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, 
No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in, Ezra, in Israel in Elijah's time. When the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy, I'm at verse 27, and the time of Elisha the prophet, yet none of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Verse 28, and all the people of the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked through the crowd and went on his way. And that is the reading of our word today. We were in Luke 4, verses 16 and all the way through 30. What's interesting here, the scene that we've stumbled upon is that previously in Luke 3, Jesus was baptized and affirmed by his father. We touched on that a little bit last week. We, we know that the scripture says when all the people were baptized, Jesus also went to be baptized and was praying and the heavens opened up and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my beloved son with you. I am well pleased. So Jesus begins his earthly ministry with the blessing of the Father and the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. And did you know, saints, in Jesus, we can have the same things. In Jesus, we can hear the Father saying to us, this is my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. In Jesus, the Holy Spirit can come upon us for empowering and blessing. So Jesus comes into Luke 4 knowing who and whose he was. And this type of clarity would serve him well during the wilderness temptation and as we see here in chapter 4. Jesus has now returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and news of him is going all over town, all over the surrounding region. He taught in the synagogues and he was glorified by all. So a few verses later, however, right at verse 16, he returns to his own synagogue in Nazareth. Since this was early in the ministry of Jesus, it's not long from the time where he lived and worked in Nazareth. So the people in the village knew him. He had probably done work for them as a carpenter. He probably was a builder for the town. But on this occasion, Jesus is in the synagogue as a learned visitor. And since this synagogue was in Nazareth, as we've already set up the scene tonight, Jesus would have attended the synagogue often before, and now he is reading and teaching. Where? In his hometown. Somebody say hometown. He's in his hometown, in his local church. So the people are marveling. He is speaking with gracious words, the Bible says. You can see that Luke has condensed a little bit from the time that Christ read the scripture. Uh, I'm sure he sat down and then began to expound on what was just read. So not only did Jesus speak on the theme that was mentioned, he did it literally with words that were full of grace. Everything was going well in church so far. The people were sensing the goodness and the grace of God in the announcement that the ministry of the Messiah was now present. But but something happened. They, it, it started to settle in their spirits and question in their minds and bubble up in their hearts and be expressed on their lips. Is this not Joseph's son? After their initial amazement, then they begin to resent that someone so familiar could speak with such grace and claim to be the fulfillment of these prophecies. So apparently, remember, Jesus had already done miracles in Capernaum. That's another region, okay? So he had already been preaching, doing miracles, and being glorified by all in Capernaum. And now we see here as I go to my notes. Let 
that the people are amazed and they are asking a few questions. They are realizing that Jesus has gone a little bit too far. The people of Nazareth want to see the same kind of thing. They want to have this type of miraculous sign or show. What you did over there, do here. So Jesus understood that it was easy for the people to doubt the power and the work of God among those who are familiar to us. It was easier for those in Nazareth to doubt or reject Jesus because he seemed so normal. He seemed so familiar to them. But then Jesus began to answer their objections. He began to tell them that, I know you want special favors because I'm in your hometown. And he starts to point out that it doesn't matter to God uh, that because God be, can work among the Gentiles just as he did in the days of Elijah and the days of Elisha. Now, this was taking things all the way too far because when the hearers begin to realize all the things that Jesus was saying, the Bible says they were filled with wrath and they rose up and wanted to thrust him out of the city. What a response to a sermon. They were angry to be told that something was wrong with them and that their request for a miracle was denied. Not only that, but Jesus is now implying that God actually loves the Gentiles. These Jews from Nazareth were defensive. Now remember, what is our text today? Uh, Luke 4, and our topic is defensiveness and responding to accusations. Amen? Defensiveness and responding to accusations. What is defensiveness all about? At its very core, defensiveness is a way to protect our ego and a fragile self-esteem. A researcher named Ellen Alley explains that our self-esteem is considered fragile when our failures, our mistakes, and imperfections decrease our self-worth. So let's explore the reaction of those in the synagogue and Jesus, because those in the synagogue did not like that week's sermon, and Jesus clearly wasn't going to be forced to perform miracles. So we see a defensiveness from those in the synagogue, but something different from Jesus altogether. What is it about Jesus that he does differently? What makes his behavior so unique to this situation? Being defensive generally means that someone is reacting in a way that is protective of themselves, either emotionally or physically. And this can manifest as defensiveness in response to a criticism, in response to a perceived threat, such as feeling attacked or being accused of doing something wrong. However, when Jesus speaks truth and it isn't received, he walked right through the crowd and he went his way. When the situation escalated and he was threatened with physical violence, he walked right through the crowd and went his way. When he was rejected, when his core identity, his authentic self was not accepted by those closest and most familiar to him, he walked through the crowd and went his way. When it was clear that their minds could not be changed and he had to radically accept that their opinion of him was what they truly believed, he walked right through the crowd and went his way. When his side of the story was not needed and judgment had already been made without any further discussion or clarification or additional questions being asked, he walked right through the crowd and went his way. Now, responding to accusations can be so challenging especially if you feel like the accusations are unfounded or unjustified. But tonight, we see that as we look at defensiveness and responding to accusations, Christ's behavior, Christ's response was very different from the Jews in Nazareth 
responding in the synagogue to something that they did not want to hear. I love the fact that we can take this all the way back to Luke 3 and really dig into Christ's clarity of his belonging and his belovedness, which makes him able to rise above any situation that he had to encounter. We, Luke is setting the stage for us. Christ is there doing good, speaking truth, and he has an enemy in the Pharisees and the religious leaders who want to literally kill him. And we're going to see this theme throughout the book of Luke. But Christ is setting the scene for us. He walks through the crowd and he goes on his way. And this isn't just him walking through the crowd, a casual walk. Remember, the Jews were literally going to throw him off the cliff. This was the first step to a good old fashioned stoning. First, you throw the person off the cliff, and then when they're there at the bottom, you pick up rocks and amen. There you have it. The, the stoning was supposed to take place because this was blasphemy. They could not believe the things that Jesus was saying. Uh, the time for discussion was over, okay? The Jews were upset. They could not believe what they were hearing, and Christ was in a situation that had escalated to, to violence. This was not the time for further discussion, right? Prayerfully, we don't find ourselves in situations that escalate to this level. But what we can do is learn and glean from Christ. There is a scripture that I found so helpful, and it's simply this, Psalm 4610. It's helpful when dealing with def being defensive, having to fight and deny your flesh, against being defensive. How many times do you wanna tell your side of the story or explain it one more time or pick up the phone just to clarify what you really meant? Uh, I, I know people didn't understand what I meant, so maybe if I just explain it again or, or, or do it differently, it can be nerve wracking and it's so hard to fight the temptation to trust God and let him fight our battle and be our defense, our shield, and our buckler. The scripture I wanted to share with you is quite simple. It's Psalm 4610. It says, be still and know that I am God. Now remember, this is when we're getting to the level of fighting the defensiveness because it's going to make our behavior uh, go into carnality and tap into behavior that is contrary to the word of God. We're not talking about having uh, a situation where you are able to talk to the person who disagrees with you or who has accused you of something. We are not talking about when you did step one, which is staying calm and composed, uh, trying to have a response. Um, even if you feel like the accusation is unfair, and this is when you have said, okay, I'm not responding with anger. I'm not responding with defensiveness. I'm not trying to escalate the conflict. I'm just trying to stay calm and composed. And step two, actively listen to what's being said. Actively listen to the accusation that's being made. Try to understand the other person's perspective. I'm even going to ask some clarifying questions. Show that I'm interested in understanding the other person's point of view. Really lean in and, and, and uh, know that the person who is speaking and the person who is coming forth with an accusation or an issue or a problem, they are a real person and they have real feelings and they did a bold thing, right, by coming to you with how they feel, okay? We have to take responsibility when appropriate. When someone comes to us with hard news, hard truth, things that we don't want to hear, if there's some truth in the accusations, we got to take responsibility and apologize. Amen? This can help diffuse the situation. It shows that I'm taking ownership. I'm listening. I, I understand that I made a mistake in this. There are some things that I could do better. I love it when my husband always steps back and says, there's always an improvement that we can make. Maybe we could have communicated better and it would have made the situation 
um, go a little bit easier. Maybe that thing wouldn't have been a misunderstanding if I would have did X, Y, and Z. There's always an opportunity to critique our behavior, to critique our response and our attitude and see, hey, this accusation is valid to the person bringing it to me. I'm going to listen. I'm going to take responsibility where appropriate. And then if it is appropriate, you can even provide evidence to the contrary. If the accusation is completely false, you can speak up for yourself. Say, that's not what I believe to be true, or that's not how I remembered it, or when it, the actuality of the situation is, I didn't mean it like that, though it was perceived that way, I actually meant it like this. But here is the deal, saints of God. We have to radically accept that you cannot change anyone's mind about their judgment of you. If their judgment of you is truth for them and they cannot be changed or swayed, you are not the Holy Spirit. I am not the Holy Spirit. And only God can change someone's heart and someone's mind. All we can do is, like I said, stay calm, compose, listen, take responsibility where appropriate. If it is appropriate and you don't think it's going to escalate things, you can provide evidence as, oh, man, I see how you saw that what I did was like that, but I actually came from it from this place and I was trying to serve from this way. And guess what? If they don't accept it, you have to radically accept that their perception of what happened is truth for them. It's true. I feel like I just need to pause and let that marinate because sometimes the defensiveness comes when we try really, really hard to change someone's mind about something that happened. And we can get defensive and try to protect our reputation and try to protect ourselves. But we have to radically accept that only the Holy Spirit can work on the heart. And maybe it's time to step into Psalm 4610. Be still. Know that he is God. Pray for that situation and trust God to do the heart work that needs to happen. If all of that takes place and you offer um, a resolution and you even try to have suggestions to work toward a resolution, a resolution, that really shows that you're trying to move forward with this person and with this situation. And it demonstrates that you have a willingness to work toward a positive outcome. But honey, if you did step one, two, three, four, and five, and we have gotten to the place where we are now in Luke 4. And no one, the truth that you are trying to convey is not being heard. It is escalating. There is no way to work out a resolution. We need to follow what Christ is teaching here. And that is he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. It is appropriate to move forward and walk away when you know for certain and for sure that you've done everything that God has given you to do to salvage a relationship and salvage a situation. Remember, we're not going into it being defensive. We, our aim is reconciliation. That is the goal. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Clearly, Jesus could not reconcile with the Jews in the synagogue, right? They wanted to throw the man off a cliff. And there might be situations where you feel like someone wants to throw your reputation off a cliff. You might feel sabotaged at work. You might feel misunderstood by close friends. Whatever it is that you're going through personally, I want you to be encouraged tonight that after you've worked through and walked through everything that you can do to move toward reconciliation in a healthy holy and wonderful way according to God's word I believe that it is biblically appropriate and sound for you to as the scripture says what does Christ do he walked right through the crowd and went on his way he went on his way knowing who he was the accusation was not him even though they believed it to be true their rejection of him did not mean that Christ was not who he was. He was the son of God. He was called by God. He had a mission. 
on this earth to do and to feel. Um, yes, he could perform miracles, but he wasn't going to have his arm twisted or be forced to do anything contrary to the perfect, good, acceptable plan of God for his ministry here on earth. Amen. So what can we take from this? Remember the scripture, Psalm 40, 16, be still, be still and know that I am God. Remember wanting to be defensive and wanting to uh, reply and respond to accusations um, in an unhealthy way really means that there is some reflection that we have to do inside because as our researcher had told us earlier, there is, is a fragile ego and a, a low sense of self-worth at work. That is why we have to always go back to Luke 3. Go back to the, your belovedness. Go back to who you belong to. Remember that not only do you belong to Christ, but you belong to his body. And being in the body means I'm in community. So we are not islands. We are not on our own. Um, we are not fending for ourselves, going home saying, no one understands me. No one loves me. And I'm completely isolated. Even in moments of isolation, we have to remember that as we're standing still, not using my mouth, not using my words, not using my hands, not using my body language as ways to defend myself or respond to accusation. I'm actually going to trust and lean into God's provision for me. I'm leaning into the truth of who he said I am. You're leaning into the truth of who he said you were. You're loved. You're called by God. Yes, you make mistakes. I make mistakes. Does that mean that someone's rejection of you is actually your truth to take on as a part of your core identity? No. Does it mean you appropriately respond to accusations to see what the truth is, to try to find common ground and understand where the person is coming from? Because remember, they are made in the image of God, the Imago Dei. We cannot forget that. And I want to close with this amazing amazing African proverb that you probably heard pastor share before and I believe that it's worth sharing again and the proverb is this because it beautifully expresses just how important face-to-face -face friendship really is and here's the proverb when I saw you from afar I thought you were a monster when you got closer I thought you were just an animal when you got even closer I saw that you were a human <clears throat> but when we were face to face, I realized that you were my brother. Amen. So the closer we get to one another, <coughs> excuse me, the easier it will be for the fear to go away. Amen. Amen, saints. Well, it is 729, and I believe that we have truly explored defensiveness and responding to accusations and, <coughs> excuse me, given ourselves a little bit of a, a guide, even when we feel like our side of the story can't be heard. It's one thing when you are faced with an accusation and you have the opportunity to work through that and um, really desire reconciliation and work towards biblical recon reconciliation, which is what God has called us to. So if your brother offends you and you know it, come and leave your gift at the altar. Okay, you all know the scriptures, amen? This is what God has called us to do, and it is so beautiful when you can work through those types of issues and conflict and come out on the other side of it. It, it just makes those friendships and relationships all the more sweeter, especially in the body of Christ. But then we also explored what it looks like when we are beyond reconciliation. This is the situation that we saw in Luke 4. We know also how to appropriately respond when someone's judgment of us is their truth and we cannot change it. Someone's belief of us that is contrary to the call of God on our life and who God called us to be is not lining up and we cannot change their mind.
important. Amen. We know how to respond to that. We can. I want to go right to that scripture where it says that Christ did what? He walked through the crowd and went on his way. I pray that tonight you will have the peace to walk away from the situations that God is calling you to walk away from and to trust and rely in knowing that you belong and that you are beloved and that you can rest in God's defense of you and you don't have to do that work on your own. So let's pray. God, we thank you for tonight's lesson. We thank you, Lord God, that um, you are just opening us up to denying ourselves. It, it is just human nature to want to get our side of the story out. But God, I thank you tonight that you have just caused us to calm down and settle into knowing who we belong to. And we are just so grateful that the stress is off now, the pressure's off. We don't have to come up with the words anymore. We can just rest and worship. We can be still and trust you, uh, God, and you give us great peace in knowing that you are our God and we belong to you. So bless those who are listening. Bless the replay and let us have an amazing time of conversation on the Zoom coming up in Jesus' name. God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining us. And Shekinah, for those of you who are staying on, I look forward to talking to you on the other side.